thank you for joining us this evening. And I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the funders who have made uh, both uh, this event uh, and the annual symposium uh, possible. Uh, and they are the R. Harold Burton Foundation, the Cultural Vision Fund, the Nature Conservancy of Utah, and Chevron, uh, all of whom have been longtime sponsors for the Stegner Center and various events. And we are very grateful for their support uh, over the years. Uh, the uh, brochure about uh, the symposium, uh, copies of the brochure, if you haven't uh, seen it before, are available uh, outside. Uh, the program includes a number of diverse presentations. Uh, among others, Dr. Michael Soule, uh, founder of the Discipline of Conservation Biology and of the Society for Conservation Biology, will uh, be with us uh, as one of the keynote speakers. Harvey Locke, who has served as president of the Canadian uh, National Parks and uh, Wilderness Association uh, and uh, an initial founder of an architect of the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative is on the program. And we also will have uh, the acclaimed photographer Florian Schultz uh, with us to make a presentation of his uh, wildlife uh, photographic work. I'd be happy uh, after the uh, event tonight to respond to any questions uh, about uh, the symposium. I also should acknowledge that uh, both this event uh, and the symposium would not be possible without uh, the support uh, both of my faculty colleagues uh, here at the law school, several of whom are here uh, in the audience. Uh, I won't uh, take the time to uh, acknowledge uh, all of them tonight. They know who they are, and uh, they make uh, doing what I do directly directing the Stegner Center, uh, just a real joy. And uh, I also uh, should acknowledge uh, the Stegner Center Associate Director, um, who was up all night uh, with her daughter, uh, but is here uh, this evening, uh, who's back there and <clears throat> who really makes things work. Please stand, Jan, and get some recognition. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Shauna Ray Cope uh, is uh, our uh, administrative assistant and uh, has been instrumental in making uh, all of the arrangements and reservations for uh, our speakers. Uh, it's now uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, an old friend uh, and uh, a former colleague, at least uh, briefly in the direct sense, uh, Professor Zygmunt Platter from Boston College uh, Law School. Uh, in terms of <clears throat> uh, a, bi a biography uh, of uh, Zig, uh, he has taught and written for a number of years in the fields of environmental law, property, and land use law, as well as administrative law. His teaching career has taken him to seven different uh, law faculties, uh, as I think uh, he will explain this evening. I was uh, fired at only one. He was fired in only one of those uh, law faculties. <clears throat> He has worked internationally uh, in Ethiopia, Costa Rica, Colombia, Nepal, and Japan, uh, and uh, most notoriously, uh, perhaps, or famously, uh, he spent uh, six years litigating uh, the snail darter uh, case uh, challenging the completion of the Teleco Dam uh, by the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, in addition, uh, Zig has uh, chaired the State of Alaska's uh, Oil Spill Commission Legal Research Task Force uh, and also been involved uh, in providing uh, legal support and assistance related to the recent uh, uh, BP Horizon uh, oil spill in the Gulf. A uh, number of us I know were here uh, this afternoon to hear uh, his experiences uh, in that uh, uh, setting. Uh, he has uh, received uh, in the year 2000 the Boston College Law School Faculty Excellence Award uh, by vote of the graduating class. He also in 2005 received the David Brower Lifetime Achievement Award at the International uh, Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Uh, he has a book uh, coming out from Yale University Press on the subject of his talk uh, this evening. Uh, more importantly, I think, uh, to try to put Zig in 
uh, full uh, context, uh, at least uh, as uh, I have known him over the years. Uh, he's an academic who has lived uh, the life of engagement with the environmental issues of his generation, Exxon Valdez, BP Horizon, the teleco uh, controversy, a uh, number of international engagements, uh, and, uh, as we will see, is a passionate advocate for the environment, a teacher par excellence, a real inspiration, uh, both for his faculty colleagues and his students, uh, and he also will tell us that this is the only fish story he knows where the fish keeps getting bigger rather than smaller. And on top of that, uh, we were able to provide him the opportunity this morning uh, to catch, uh, or yesterday I should say, uh, to catch uh, several fish uh, much larger than the snail darter out of the Provo <laughs> River, for which he's now eternally grateful to me. Exactly. Thank you, Zig, for being with us. Would you like your glasses? Yes, let me yes. get this back from you. Thank you so much. I, I am just incredibly honored to be here. Um, in this beautiful state, which I haven't known, um, and to be in the same breath with Wallace Stegner and with Joseph Sachs, uh, who was the Stegner speaker last year. Um, I, I am humbled, and um, I hope I can live up to that introduction but I have been fired once already, so if it happens again tonight, I, I, I'm all set. Um, I owe a great deal to, 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 to Bob. Um, he, however, doesn't come back east, uh, and, and Wallace Stegner did. Every summer, he came back east, and uh, I guess Bob and Linda discovered that there was all this west out here, west of the Potomac, and uh, <laughs> uh, like Wallace Stegner, they love the West, but they haven't explored it enough. So, so send him back east once in a while, would you? Uh, I have to tell you that I am using you tonight. Bob said that, yes, I, I have this uh, book that I'm doing for Yale Press, but it's in second draft. But the third draft is what I'm trying to craft uh, with your help. Now, uh, for, for some of you in this uh, room, you, you weren't alive when any of this happened. For many of the rest of you who heard of this story, you heard of it, and <laughs> me as an object of ridicule, uh, and, and environmental extremism. Um, but the thought is that from the distance of 30 years, perhaps it can be made uh, relevant in a way that's a little bit clearer than the way it has been remembered. I mean, today, uh, even liberals think of this as the most extreme environmental case ever. Bobby Kennedy was feeling very awkward about it. Uh, uh, our vice president, Joe Biden, uh, just six or seven weeks ago said, well, we don't want to be like snail darters stopping progress. Uh, and Stephen Colbert, I don't know where you put him, but Sean Hannity, who said that these fringe uh, uh, environmental extremists, uh, um, Rush Limbaugh referred to me uh, and to some of others who, who were protecting endangered species is uh, homo socialists who are trying to attack capitalism in corporate America. I, I think that wasn't intended as a compliment. Um, and, 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 and Coulter and in George Will, it goes on and on and on. Uh, but part of the problem is that that was the story then and it continues to be an icon of ridicule and foolishness that hurts progressive in, uh, initiatives, not just environmental, but the snail darter has been brought up and thrown at progressive uh, initiatives uh, in a wide range uh, of other areas. Don't be a snail darter person. Well, I'm afraid I am, it's going to be on my gravestone. I'm a snail darter person. So, so uh, how to do this? It seems to me there, there are three questions that maybe can come from the, the PowerPoint story that we're going to go through. It's a true story, and I will try to be as true to the facts as I can, because I'm not only an advocate, but I'm an academic. And, and that means that I realize that I lose uh, credibility and I lose your faith if, if, if I uh, am one-sided. The problem in this case, as in many environmental cases, is that the facts are terribly one-sided. 
and, and so uh, pull me back if I get a little bit uh, 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 strident, but, but very often the facts will be strident as well. Um, the three questions, it seems to me, because we have the conference that, that Bob and Shauna and Jan have, have arranged for tomorrow on wildlife, why do people care about wildlife? And how much do they really care about wildlife? That, that's the first question. The, the second question is, is wildlife protection a separate category? Or is it part of a larger set of human ecosystems? Or put it differently, were my students and I uh, rank hypo <laughs> hypocrites to use an endangered species for purposes that Congress never would have intended? Um, OK, you got that one. Um, and the third is, is governance, because it seems to me this story uh, was, I was so honored to be able to have this thing fall in my lap and to work with, as you will see, some very remarkable people. Uh, part of, of a governance process that could have happened only in America. Um, and, and still, it's not perfect, so that's part of our job uh, for, for uh, the future. All right, let, let's start this way. Um, how, how should I, I start? Should, should we focus on, on the fish? Uh, or should we focus on the dam? Or, and, and this is, as you will see, quite an indicative question. Should we focus uh, on the farmers? Um, well, because this is a wildlife week in Utah, let's, let's focus on the fish. Um, this is uh, Persina amastomus tenasi. It is, uh, um, this is the lithograph exhibit 12 at, at trial. Uh, and, and it is almost perfect in, in its uh, meristic details. The, the, uh, and, and you can see the size. Uh, they don't get bigger than three inches. Uh, and they like cool, clear, uh, highly oxygenated water flowing over clean, not muddy, substrate in fairly shallow uh, uh, rivers. Um, and this shows uh, that Tennessee doesn't, didn't have enough dams. Um, <laughs> Along the eastern side of the state uh, is the Appalachians, the Smokies uh, and, and the Cherokee National Forest. Uh, and you can see there are a whole bunch of dams that were built there. Um, but coming then to the side, um, if, if you look at it, uh, this is now much flatter territory. So there are 68 dams in this picture. 25 linear miles of river have been stopped up because when you're in flat country, one dam backs up almost all the way to the next dam. So the last 33 miles of high quality flowing water was, do you see the blue dot? That was the Teleco project, the Little Tennessee River flowing out of the mountains. Uh, I think I have a shot. OK, this, how many of you have been to the Smokies? It's the most uh, visited national park. You probably went into uh, Gatlinburg here, perhaps, or Townsend there. But this is where Dolly Parton's Six Gun City and the uh, dinosaur land, and the only hula hula porpoise show in the Appalachians. Um, so, so and, and do you see all the circles? What do you suppose the circles are? Those are dams. Uh, and, and so there are a whole lot of them. There, there are 24 dams within 50 miles of this particular area. And here it comes out of the mountains and flows roughly northwest to a junction with the Big Tennessee. This is a lake here, and this is another lake that comes up to here. Um, all right. And this is a view um, almost uh, uh, real, uh, showing, again, the, the mountains. Uh, here are the Smokies, and this is the Cherokee National Forest. Here's the Little Tennessee River dammed, and then it there's another dam here, and then the last 33 miles down through to the Big Tennessee. Um, if, if you look at this, you can see uh, how, how uh, meandering, how, how shallow it, uh, well, you can't see the shallow. Uh, but the point is that if you look in the far distance, those are the mountains, which has a, a bunch of dams. And here it is flowing. There are shoals right here that we'll talk about, more shoals. Uh, there, and, and that has a biological uh, reason because 
It's those gravelly shoals that are particularly important for spawning uh, on this particular uh, species. Uh, the dam site that TVA built uh, in 68 was down there uh, to the right. Well, uh, let's see. Um, if if I, I, this, I apologize, it isn't, isn't so great, but there's an important biological reason uh, for, for showing it. Coiti Spring, right here, is where the major gravel bar where the uh, uh, little fish was first discovered, uh, and um, it is the type habitat. But it turns out that once they spawn, they like to eat their young, uh, which is not a good uh, evolutionary pattern. So the larval, it's called larval drift. They come down here. Here there was a deep hole uh, that the Cherokee said was inhabited by a water monster. Uh, and throughout its range, it needed shoals and then deep areas to retreat through. And then when they were big enough not to fit in mommy and daddy's mouth, they would come swimming back up to the home shoals, uh, really uh, a special domestic arrangement. Uh, and, and here, we'll talk a little bit more about this picture later, but you, you can see this was taken not in an aquarium, but in the river. What does that tell you? It's incredibly clear. And it, this is from a movie, the, the grass is moving like that, so it's the current, it's rough gravel stra uh, substrate with a lot of uh, caddis uh, uh, and, and little snails. Uh, and and uh, there they are. We'll talk more about them in a moment. But that water quality uh, is, is important for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, because there wasn't a dam. Dams, you, you know, do what? They, you slow down water and it gets warmer or, or colder? Warmer, right. And, and it becomes. Uh, more diverse or less diverse? More algae or less? Of, uh, you, you get the picture. Uh, and also, this was well, whoops, well buffered because uh, the, there was no erosion off the banks. Um, and, and it turns out that the soil was just incredibly rich. I grew up uh, plowing stones in the northern Appalachians. I would have died uh, to have soil like this. Uh, 20 feet deep of USDA grade uh, uh, 1 and 2. Uh, and, and so good that this place had the oldest continuous human habitation in the continental United States. More than 10,000 years of continuous human uh, uh, habitation uh, in, in this area. The Cherokee uh, came uh, only at the end of the woodland period, uh, but if you, you can see uh, it's a little bit fuzzy on, on the arrowheads. This map was done by the first British uh, uh, commander to come over the mountains to do a treaty, I believe, with the Cherokee, uh, Henry Timberlake. Uh, the enemy mountains, what do you suppose those are? The Smokies, exactly. And they're coming through. Echota was the Jerusalem of the Cherokees. It was one of those cities of refuge where you couldn't bring weapons and. And, and you were safe when you were there. Uh, here uh, is Tokwa. We'll see uh, a mound there. Tomotli and Tuskegee. A sequoia was built, uh, was built, was born here in Tuskegee. And there was old Fort Loudon at the bottom of a crescent that went from Fort Duquesne, Fort Pitt up in Pittsburgh, protecting against the French and Indians, uh, down to here, Fort Loudon, uh, built by the Cherokee and by the British to defend against the, the, the French. Uh, and, and the Indians, uh, uh, um, the, the Iroquois in particular. Uh, an incredibly historic place. Um, and the Toqua Mound, it had been hit a little bit by grave robbers, but, but you can see it was a ceremonial mound, really quite, quite amazing uh, when you uh, passed it in the fog in the morning. Uh, and this is Coiti Spring. Uh, this uh, apparently is the place where the first treaty between the British and the Cherokee was actually executed. Little stream you can't see so very well coming out just past the daffodils there in the middle. But here you can see a little bit better. Oops, uh, where is my, all right. This is where the spring comes out and then it flows down through here and then ultimately out a channel into the Little Tennessee River, uh, which is about a quarter of a mile broad but quite shallow and there's a gravel bar right there uh, which we will talk about. Uh, this is now the farmers. Uh, the, the farming uh, in, in this bottom land, uh, there was 16,000 continuous acres of the best land. 
uh, really quite, quite extraordinary, that would be covered with from six to 10 feet uh, of water and mud uh, uh, if, if the reservoir is to be built. Uh, and obviously, uh, with land like that, the community is extraordinary. Some of these farmers' families uh, had, were descended from those who came in in 1817. Uh, and then took over the Cherokee land when Andy Jackson drove uh, all the Cherokee out in 1835, excuse me, drove out the Cherokee that he could catch in 1835. My clients, uh, the, the, the Kala band, which means the wild ones, went up into the Smokies and hid out until J Andy Jackson died. Uh, here you, you can see these are beans, uh, corn sacred to the Cherokee, um, and it was also incredible fishing. If you look down at David uh, uh, Skates at the right, a Vietnam vet who basically put in 2,000 hours uh, working for the river, you can see the river wasn't crystal clear if you looked at it at a distance. It was milky with limestone. Is that good or bad? That's very good. It, it's, it's, it's the, the limestone, uh, limestone streams of England are where uh, Isaac Walton fished. This was just amazing. Uh, there wasn't a great deal of natural reproduction, but the hatchery turned out not to be the answer because if they put fingerlings here, they grew faster in this river than they did in a hatchery, which I find hard to believe. But I have sworn testimony on that. Uh, oops. And, and oh, uh, this, it's not a very clear one, but it, it was an extraordinary place. Um, I, I, when you walked over the fields after a rain, the only stones in, in the soil were arrowheads, uh, broken spear points, and, and, and a little crock. You know, uh, on a plowed field when it rains, the, the stones show. Um, I, I once walked out into the river, and I didn't want to get so deep, so I walked out on, on this log. And, and I, my buddy shouted, do you know what you're on? I said, I'm on a log. Uh, and, and he said, look carefully. It was a big V. I was going on one V. He was standing on another. What, what was that, do you suppose? A big V coming down like this and then open at the bottom, a fish trap. So, so the Cherokee would have the kids and the women hitting the water with, with brush and then the guys would be down there with the spears. This was in 1973. And, and it was still these logs, obviously water logs staked there maybe uh, um, for, for all that time. And, and once I was going fishing, you know how in fog sound carries? So, so I hear this, Splash! I said, what's that? Oh, it's just a Cherokee going to water. I said, what? Um, the Cherokee, when Andy Jackson died, didn't come back here. They went to the other side of Cherokee, North Carolina. But the medicine men, Amanita Sequoia, great-great-grandson of, of Sequoia, and, and Lloyd Sequoia were, were the medicine men who were the, they would come here to gather medicine and then go into, so, splash, and then about three minutes later, splash. And, and I, I couldn't tell whether they were 100 yards away or a half a mile away, but the spookiness of this place. All right, so, but there are many extraordinary places uh, in, in, in the world, and some of them have to yield to progress. Uh, and, and so the people who love this place, which is everyone who knew it, uh, uh, had, were, were faced uh, with what? Uh, well, TVA, in, founded in 1933, did a catalog of all 69 places where you could build a dam. Uh, and they built them all except this one. And so this was the last one uh, left. And it, uh, on the second Sunday uh, of March uh, in 1959, Red Wagner, the uh, uh, all-powerful chairman of TVA called a meeting uh, of, of his uh, head lieutenants uh, in, at Watts Bar Meeting House, which was right down there, um, and, and said, we are going to build a teleco dam. And they said, but it can't be justified in electric generating terms or in water supply or in flood control. Uh, what am I doing wrong, Mark? I was getting, is, is the sound okay? Okay. Um, the, that, you know, it just couldn't be. He said, I want you to put your heads to work. We're going to make this work. 
uh, the morale of the agency, according to the official history written of the TVA, had been going down. They'd been turning, after all of these uh, uh, projects, most of them which were hydroelectric, which justified generators, which the Teleco Dam would not, um, they'd switched to, to coal and to nuclear. And they were starting to feel just like another utility uh, company. They were losing morale, and this was going to recharge it. How? Because they would, you see down there, Timberlake, that was the, how did you hear Timberlake? Where did you hear the name? The name of Colonel Timberlake of the British Fusiliers. Um, they would say, all right, what is that black? That is not the river. That is a dammed up river. But as you can see, if, if you look carefully, it's less than one third of the project area. So the idea that the agency came up with is there are 300 family farms in this valley. We can condemn them for an average of $330 an acre, exclusive of, of, of buildings. And then we will turn this over to the Boeing Corporation to build a model city to be called Timberlake. All right? And economic development will justify the condemnation of 38,000 acres for a 12,000 acre uh, reservoir. Uh, and off we, well, Boeing pulled out shortly afterwards saying, this is ridiculous. Uh, there, you're not going to have a city of 40,000 people with 26,000 jobs, which is what the agency said uh, is behind this project. Uh, but the agency said, we'll go on anyway. This was without Boeing. You no longer have a city, but you have four uh, or five village centers. TVA did not want to let go uh, of the project uh, once it started rolling. Does this sound familiar? Uh, and that was the dam. They built it in 1968, uh, and, and it's small. That's not a tree at the bottom. That's a bush. Uh, to show Congress how small it was, uh, I took a pebble and put a student on the other side, and I threw a pebble over, and I carried it to Congress, and I said, look at this pebble. I threw it over, and then I rolled, and look at this arm. Uh, it's a very small dam. Uh, you have to do some things sometimes to get people to recognize the, 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 what you're talking about. What else did I want to say about that? Um, excuse me. I, all right. Um, Oh, yes, you're looking at $4 million, $4,080,000 in, in, in cement and rebar. And it had been there since 68, and it sat for 10 years because they were condemning land and they were doing other things. Uh, and, 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 and we'll see, the, the, the farmers got a bit in the way. Uh, this is the official benefit cost ratio uh, under Senate document 97, every public works pork barrel project had to have a theoretical, hypothetical payback of more than one dollar for every dollar uh, of appropriations that were spent. What was the reason to build this dam? What was the major reason? Recreation, do you see? By eliminating the last river left in the region with high quality trout fishing att attracting anglers from four states and, and the only s river remaining that was family float trips, Boy Scouts, they would go down floating and then stop on an island, look for arrowheads and so forth. Uh, you would improve recreation by, by 1.4 uh, uh, million a year. And the second, shoreline development. Profit from selling the land that had been condemned from the farmers. All right? Um, I don't have to exaggerate. Uh, by the way, every single number in this was ultimately proved to be false. Um, and, and we uh, knew that to be the case. Uh, but all right, we were up against an iron triangle. I don't know. How many of you have heard about iron triangles? Now, it's, it's a wonderful concept from political science. It, when you go, how many of you have worked in, in, in a legislature or worked around a legislature? In a cap, yeah, I see a few people embarrassed to admit it. Uh, the <laughs> any legislature. Uh, the, the point is that there are triangles which form, which operate daily, uh, weekly, monthly, always out of the public eye, uh, typically, 
and they're formed of these three branches. You, you, you've got, uh, uh, you can start anywhere. Uh, here's an agency uh, that says bureaucrat, uh, but that's Red Wagner, the, the dominant uh, head of TVA, who swore that he would never lose a, a, a project to, to citizens uh, and, and called me a communist. Um, then you have industry that wants to come in, not only to build the dam, but uh, the real estate industry was thinking uh, this would be a, a useful thing, and so some of the dominant industry uh, input was there. And this is the local delegation. Oh, no, excuse me, not, this, is, this is Congress, and it's not actually just the local delegation. In fact, very often you will find that, for instance, mining, there will be in the mining triangle people in, from Delaware. How much mining is there in Delaware? But they get pulled in and become part of, of the system. Uh, the currency is power and money. And this is an incredibly difficult uh, 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 geometrical form to, to deal with. Timber, the same way as you can imagine. Ranching, am I being a little bit controversial? Public works, uh, uh, the pork barrel projects are quintessential uh, iron triangles. And the political power of these is understood by everyone in, in, in the legislature. Uh, and you know, day in and day out, unless the public is looking closely, uh, the, the triangles uh, tend to roll, if that's not mixing geometry too much. Um, all right, I can't remember where I am here. So, oh, the farmers, however, said, this is ridiculous. There is no one who is going to come and build a 40,000 person city in the middle uh, of nowhere. Uh, there is, uh, this is taking our land. Now this was a local testimony. This is Gene Ritchie. Uh, and then 30 years later, uh, Jean Ritchie, still gesturing with her hand, as you notice. Uh, you should have seen her uh, in the halls of Congress. This is uh, Alfred Davis. Again, a local hearing, uh, but uh, these farmers and a bunch of other farmers, they would get a fleet of cars and drive all night uh, up to Washington. Uh, oh, this is the oldest pair of farmers. This is Nell McCall and Asa, her husband, standing uh, on, on their farm. Uh, there were about 130 acres. Only two and a half acres would be flooded. They said, hell, we'll give you those. Just let us keep our farm. Uh, and you should see, uh, you should have seen Nell uh, backing senators up against marble walls. Uh, just, you don't know what you're talking about. This is just communism, right? Uh, and, and they, they uh, listen briefly. Th this. <laughs> And, and we, there would be these gatherings. Uh, this one, uh, farmers, Cherokee, and, and a lot of university students from uh, University of Tennessee. Um, and, I, and this is, you can't see very well, but we, we organized a, a tractor motorcade you know, into Knoxville to the TVA headquarters. I wanted them to bring honey wagons behind the tractors, but. Do you say honey wagons here? Yeah, manure spreaders, OK. Um, but this is what the farmers and, and the fishermen and the, the, the socialist law professors were arguing is a far more valuable development project. Get the farmers back on their land, those that had been driven off, uh, uh, those, uh, those, you know, give them back their land for $330 an acre, those that were still there, keep them there. And, and do you see, our industrial park is much bigger than their industrial park because the center of it didn't have any mud and water on it. And what is that red line? Those of you who went to the Smokies through Gatlinburg had to go through Dinosaur Valley and, 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 and Porpoise, Hula Hula, whatever it was called. But Boyd Everson, the superintendent of, of the Smoky Mountains, may he rest in peace, was working with us uh, undercover because it was incredibly uh, uh, risky to be known to be dealing with citizens. So, but he said, this is a way to have the horseback riding that's destroying the park done here in the valley. But do you see, each of these is an architect uh, archaeological or historical site leading tourists from I-75. This carries tourists from 
Flo from Florida to Chicago and Detroit. And I-40 is the major east-west uh, leading people up through here. And we said, you know, the tourism of that is right in your hands. This is an incredible place. O Ohio generates $2 million a year from their historical trail. And they don't have a, a, an outhouse compared to what the Little Tennessee River uh, had to show in historical terms. I'm sorry, those of you from Ohio. Uh, and then, finally, the breakthrough. Uh, David Etnier over there on the right, and Wayne Starnes, the second from the right, uh, with the bushy hair, uh, were uh, looking for fish in the Little Tennessee River right at Coiti Spring. Uh, that's Buck, the, the field manager, up, up uh, just above there, the, the, the dog. Um, and and Etnier actually bent over with his glasses, and he saw, he said, a perch that he'd never seen before. And he is one of the world's uh, uh, experts on, on perches. He reached, and literally with his hands, not with a net, stood up and walked over to the gravel bar. So he, said he didn't want to lose it. And he called everybody around, uh, including two TVA di di divers that, that he had trained who were working for TVA, and said, look at this. I know every perch in the world, and I've never seen this thing before. And they popped it in a bottle, and they walked over. And Bill uh, Cottrell was there with his dog, dog uh, by name. And, 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 and Etnar said, uh, Mr. Cottrell, I, I think we may have found an endangered species that's going to save your farm. Um, so, so the hypocrisy was there from the beginning, if you're Rush Limbaugh. Um, and, and here it is. Uh, TVA always supplied the picture with a paper clip beside it uh, to set up to frame the story. Gigantic hydroelectric dam, $150 million hydroelectric dam. What was the $150 million? Condemning the farms, building highways, building bridges. Uh, but that was the story as it was framed. In any event, you can see uh, it was small. Um, Hank Hill. I had a student who had imprudently flunked out of law school. And he drank a lot of beer with a bunch of ichthyology graduate students. And we got him back into law school. And he was looking for a topic to write on. And they said, well, we found an endangered species in the middle of the teleco project. So he came to me and he said, they found an endangered species in the middle of the teleco project. Do you think that's enough for a 10-page paper? <laughs> I, I said, yes, I, I thought it was. Uh, and we started uh, uh, researching. This is the entire Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act of 1973, which became law a month uh, and, and a week after the uh, snail darter was discovered in August uh, of 1973. All right, you don't have to be a lawyer to know this is verbiage. But if you take your pencil, there are at least two and perhaps three prohibitions hiding in here, which could become the counts of our complaint if this ever was to happen. All right, so, so do you see? Where, where do you go? Imagine this was written by two people I know. Uh, did they say prevention of destructive federal projects? What if it had said that? On, on. Instead, it says interagency cooperation. How wussy can you get? All right? So now, take your pencil. The interior secretary shall review other programs administered by him and utilize such programs and further the person. Most LAs and lobbyists at that point tuned out. OK. All right? All right. Pencils. All federal agencies shall. If it said may. No, nothing. But it says shall. Shall what? All right, now elision. You go dot, 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 shall utilize their authorities. That's, that's so boring. And when you're starting out with a statute that has not been tried, it, it, there, would, uh, there were two uh, uh, cases that were going uh, 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 at the same time, uh, other than, than this one. Um, but you have to get facts that are as clear as possible, and you have to pin down law. That's, so forget the utilize. Shall what? What verb? Shall. No, I don't want utilize. 
shall, what, what, what? Carry out programs for the conservation. Go TVA and carry out a program for conservation. Good, we'll transplant them somewhere else. Do, do, do you see? So, so that, that possibly, that was used uh, uh, in, in Hawaii, uh, but, but it has not been used much. No, no, we need another verb. Shall, shall ensure, that's what I did. I said, shall ensure what? Shall ensure that, no, where, where are we now? Shall, that actions authorized, funded, or carried out by them. What does that cover? Totally everything, right? Do not jeopardize the continued existence. That was count one. Or destroy or modify habitat that's critical. Hidden like a snake in the grass within that paragraph were those words which were count one and count two uh, of a possible complaint. Which is going to be easier to prove? Isn't it? Number two. Because for the, there will be ranges of experts. I wasn't going to talk about this, but TVA was hiring a biologist to testify. Uh, uh, and, uh, Etnire and, and Williams call them biostitutes. Uh, <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so, and, and this should make you proud to be in America. The rest of the world shakes its head and says, oh my god. As one German said, you Americans are all cowboys because you can go to court and bring in a minister. And, and, but do you see, any person may commence a suit against any person, including the United States and any other governmental instrumentality, who is alleged to be in violation. All you have to do is file a 60-day letter. Some of you have already done this, and you know it, it, it's not completely easy, but it couldn't be done anywhere else in the world. Uh, so, so that's what we had available, but would we do it? Uh, I, I was a junior professor already in hot water for taking on too many environmental cases. Um, so Hank and I drove down to Fort Loudon here. Do, do you see? Uh, it was slightly reconstructed by the New Deal, but it was still up on a bluff looking down the river here and then up the river this way back to the Smokies. It was a lookout. There were, all the trees had been cut when, when, when the Cherokee and the British were using it as a fort. But it was the place where the farmers had met over the years. And four years before, they had filed a, a NEPA action. They said there's no environmental impact statement. Uh, and TVA said, we don't have to do environmental impact statements because we're an emergency agency. What's the emergency that TVA was created to, to handle? The Great Depression. Right, so which was somewhat over by the time. But the farmers were lucky, were able to get a 16-month injunction, at which point uh, uh, TVA did an EIS. Uh, but of course, what NEPA means is it's purely procedural. You have to describe the bad things that you propose to do. And when you've described them accurately, you can go forward and do them. Uh, and, and so uh, I mean, that's the sad truth. So uh, the farmers lost, and their hearts were broken. Some moved away. Uh, uh, a number, an amazing number of farmers, when you took them away from their farms, the older ones especially, died. Uh, there, there, there is something linking uh, you to, 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 to land. But we said, pardon? By the way, if, if somebody wants to jump in, just, just yell whenever. Uh, and Shauna, where are you? Oh, OK. Uh, um, she has a mic if, if we need it. Um, the, we said, let's meet one more time. The farmers would come there for a potluck. There was a little uh, building, I think it's right there, that was used for maintenance. And, and so the farmers would go in there and fight and fight. And then th their hearts had been broken. They came back once more and they said, why are we here? And, and, and so we said, well, there's this fish. And there's the Endangered Species Act. And I went through the, the statute with them, and they said, that sounds like two prohibitions. But you realize TVA is incredibly powerful in this region, and it's linked into the pork barrel in the rest of the country. And, and so we've tried. We've gone and testified, and we've just been beaten into the ground. Uh, and Hank. 
uh, said, goddamn TVA, and, and, and that's the, uh, Hank, he, he, he's from the hills, and, and, and really, uh, he scared them more, more than, than got them going, it seems to me. But, but oh, oh, so there we go. You go up the hill and then in, in through a gate. We were up there just behind where that log cabin is. Asa uh, was sitting there in his coveralls, just listening. He wasn't talking. Uh, Nell was saying about how TVA was so high-handed, was saying uh, was TVA didn't have to go to a jury to get condemna condemnation wards. There were three TVA employees who would decide how much money uh, you would get. And then you'd go to court and get it crammed back in your face because the local judge uh, didn't rule against TVA. Um, let me back away from that. In any event, Asa took off that hat. He said, I never heard of this fish, but I say, if it might save our farms, we gotta try. And he passed it around, we got $29. And that was the start of our lawsuit. But do you see, we weren't going to do this without real people as plaintiffs. You, you needed to have the core of, of people who, and, and the fishermen, of course, uh, uh, were, uh, there were two fishermen there that evening as well. And we said, look, for the first couple of weeks, this story is going to be a joke. Everybody's going to laugh at the ridiculous little fish that, that's going up against the dam. But then the media will have to look further and they will find the underlying story and the underlying economics. And for the first time, we will be listened to. That little fish is the canary in the coal mine. Now, in, in the Cumberland Mountains uh, of Tennessee, but also in England and in, uh, in, in West Virginia, in the old days, they would carry, what was it, methane that you can't smell, but it can kill. And so when the sensitive little species starts fading, that tells you that human uh, welfare is deeply uh, uh, endangered as well. Uh, and, and so we were saying, you know, what, what is the major cause of endangerment, of extinction? Is it people shooting endangered species? What is it? It's habitat destruction, right? So, so the fact that, look at that map, the habitat had been destroyed there, 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 there. This was a vivid little indicator, we argued. Most reporters had never heard canary in a coal mine. So I was using barometer of human values that have been ignored uh, by the pork barrel. And so we raised money. Uh, that You're looking at a $16,000 uh, t-shirt. Uh, we sold uh, these things. Um, and, and do you see, uh, Jaws had just come out as a movie. So do you see T-V-A? Coming up to DC to, all right. Uh, lawsuits, uh, citizen suits and t-shirts go together. Uh, um, all right. And so we went to court. Uh, uh, judge Robert Taylor uh, was the judge. And he looked at me and said, um, would you stop this dam for a red-eyed cricket? And, and, and that gives you an idea of, of the level of discussion. He would not allow us to, to uh, take in any deference to the Department of Interior uh, having listed it. We had worked long and hard to get it listed. And, and, and Jim Williams, that biologist from Alabama, was critically important in sneaking that through the political process. Uh, and, and then I got a subcommittee chair to threaten a hearing if it wasn't listed. Boom, we got it listed. It comes to his court. He says, forget the listing. You gotta show me it's endangered. And then I said, yes, your honor, and we're gonna show you the violations. Uh, I, by the way, I wasn't doing this alone. Boone Doherty, a descendant of, of Daniel Boone, was the local counsel uh, uh, and, and who lived across the street from the judge. Um, and, and so the, 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 the case was not allowed to talk about alternatives to the dam. If there's a violation, he would then decide whether there was going to be an injunction. Well, he doesn't, wasn't very clear, but he said, the dam is in all likelihood going to destroy the only known population of this uh, species. Um, and it will clearly modify and destroy the habitat. But it would be foolish to stop a dam from being completed uh, that's already built. And so he dismissed us. Uh, but if you're going to lose a trial, which would you rather lose on, the law or the facts? 
You would rather lose on the law because the facts go up on appeal as if they're found. And he had given us number one and number two. Uh, and the, the Court of Appeals, uh, uh, oh, oh, before I get there, I, I have to give you this. One of the great moments uh, in, in the trial, and, and there were a number of not so great moments, what was when Wayne Starnes, who was getting his doctorate, remember, the, the bushy-haired fellow? Uh, he had been with an underwater movie camera uh, the week before the trial, just by accident. And so he brought this in, and we dimmed the lights in the court, uh, and, and, and so. Uh, this is from, from uh, the, the second draft of, of the trial chapter of my book. Starnes now throws the three-minute video sequence onto a courtroom screen. The lights dim. Don't, don't dim the lights, Mark. And shaky images appear. All right, Starnes says, this is the male laying here with the female immediately in front of him. This is a bit of preliminary courtship behavior. Ah, he's lying immediately behind her now but she's a lot more worried about me being there than he is. He's much more intent on what he is doing. Laughter from the courtroom, where 180 pairs of eyes are peering intently into the small, watery boudoir. <laughs> now he's doing a tail-wagging movement to get her attention off me. Oh, yeah, and now he's dropping down on her, coming over her left hind quarter here. A hush falls on the crowd. This is the sex part of my le lecture. <laughs> Now onto her right quarter. You see him place his left pectoral fin in a crossover maneuver. He's stroking the tail of her body with his pectoral, but oh, oops, she moves away this time. Oh, coming up now, oh, very heavy courtship again. Impossible spawning, I think. Look, they're moving in unison. Oh no, she moved away again. No, now they're going through the same maneuver. He's stroking her with his left pectoral, then crossing over to her other side. Now there, see, a violent quivering of her body and he's waving his anal fin very violently. Now he's moving the sand around it, depositing eggs. That's the end of it. You can turn on the lights now. Uh, the, the, the hush in the court was broken. Uh, and and, and uh, it was a, a vivid moment. Uh, I tell my students, never ignore graphics. Graphics, graphics, all right. So, so, but we took it to the Sixth Circuit, and the Sixth Circuit said unanimously, this law is violated. And TVA's attorney said, yes, Your Honor, but we're asking you to rescind the law or amend it. Uh, this is the level of lawyering I was up against. In Tennessee, you would never lose to TVA, but you get them out of the valley. And, and, and the judge leaned over. Uh, uh, this was Wade McCree. How am I doing on time? Because there's a wonderful story here. I'll tell it maybe later. Uh, he was writing notes as I was talking. And, and I started off like this. And, and he said, counsel, counsel. Before you skylark, lay a foundation for us, because not all of us may be following you. He said, looking to either side, uh, uh, to his fellow judges, right? I was, I'm thinking, but he's getting it. He's writing it down. Uh, um, and, and he said, you know, counsel, we don't normally amend or, or rescind statutes here. Uh, uh, and uh, well, well, then just don't follow it in this case, Your Honor, uh, in any event. I learned later what he was writing was a limerick. This is Ray, Wade McCree, the smartest judge I've ever argued in front of. Boston Latin, uh, African American from, from Detroit. Uh, sing hail for the lowly snail darter, the fish that would not be a martyr. He screwed over the dam in the waters he swam. Can you think of a fish any smarter? <laughs> He wasn't writing down notes on my oral argument. <laughs> but once the injunction came down, there was this explosion across the nation of ridicule. Paul Harvey, you, you, the young ones here don't know Paul, it was the Rush Limbaugh of, of, of the earlier days. Time for common sense, minnows are electric. It's not a minnow, it's a perch. Uh, environmental extremism. Uh, and, and, and it was not just the Tennessee people. In fact, it was mostly not. Uh, the Corps of Engineers was deep into this because they were trying to build a second river, uh, the Tennessee Tom Bigby River. We, we already have a Mississippi. If you don't have a river, they'll build a river for you. Uh, and it was a $4 billion project. And Jim Williams, the same biologist, had told Senator Stennis that there were three endangered species within the, the creeks that were going to be destroyed. So, but beyond that, 
this was a way of bringing public attention to projects that could not withstand the public eye. Um, so it went to the Supreme Court. I, I should say, I, I was told to fly up to Washington. I had a wonderful dean, having been fired at Tennessee, uh, for I was told I did not understand the moderation required of a Tennessee law professor. Um, my dean in Michigan said, if you teach on Mondays and Tuesdays, that, does that give you enough time in Washington? And so that, that, that's the kind of dean you want. Uh, so I was sleeping on couches, going to congressional offices, going into the agencies to make sure that uh, the Carter administration just had come in and they had no idea what was going on. I worked a little bit with the White House staff. Uh, you have to figure, Washington uh, is, is a, a, a jungle that exists within the Beltway. Uh, you know, you were born there. Uh, and and it's, it's, people outside the Beltway don't understand. And the people within the Beltway know that people outside don't understand. So what you have to do is bring the message. And every uh, week or so, farmers would arrive, sometimes Cherokees. Hank Hill would come up, and I had a couple of other students who would come up. And we would try to coordinate what they had to do. And the, there was a push from the Edison Electric Institute, the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, and, and from the Army Corps to put through a bill to overturn either the dam uh, 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 injunction in particular or Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act. And we were able to say, look, there's a Supreme Court case coming. Let the court handle it. And so by the skin of our teeth, we, we avoided uh, having a, a repealer uh, amendment stuck in. And so we went in front of these guys. Uh, I was shaking like a leaf. Uh, 17 seconds, oh, oh, I should tell you, um, we almost didn't get there. Rehnquist got five votes to reverse us summarily without an oral argument because he knew from the media that we were a joke and he got four others to say, look, we don't want to hear oral argument. Justice Blackmun said, look, we have to hear the merits of the case even if we unanimously decide against it. And because of Blackman, I didn't know this at the time, uh, I was able to come up uh, and argue. What do I want to tell you about the Supreme Court? Um, I, I think, um, yeah, uh, at, at one point, Powell said to me, what good is this little fish? Can you eat it? Can you use it for bait? Now, now that is actually a very significant question. It's asking, what is the reason for protecting endangered species. Uh, uh, is it uh, morality? Is it a sentiment? Is it utilitarian? And, and he was on which? Utilitarian, right? And, and, and so I said, Your Honor, this little fish, as Exhibit 12 at trial would show, is uniquely adapted to the only remaining 33-mile stretch of flowing river. And the amazing thing was, when I said Exhibit 12 at trial, I'd given a stack of lithographs. By the way, we were selling them for 18 bucks a piece, but I gave them to the justices so it wasn't. Well, anyway. Uh, he jumps up, and he goes down the bench and hands a lithograph to the justices. As there's, I'm saying, there's at least one more vote I'm getting when you look into its little brown eyes. Uh, but the serious point is it does put an image in the mind of the justice about what this is all about. Plus, it showed the river environment, the little caddis, the little snails, uh, and so forth. All right. Uh, th there it is, Exhibit 12 at trial. Uh, and, and so Justice Berger delivered a very sarcastic majority opinion. He gave the opinion to himself when he realized that he was losing 5 to 4. It's 6-3 our favor. We have no expert knowledge on the subject of endangered species, much less do we have a mandate from the people to strike a balance of equities on the side of the Teleco Dam. Balance of equities. This was almost not an environmental argument. It was mostly about whether you get an injunction from balancing the equities. And he said, Congress has spoken in the plainest of words, making it a, did it? making it abundantly clear that the balance has been struck in favor of endangered species, thereby adopting a policy which it described as institutionalized caution, which had been put in there uh, uh, by uh, a representative from Wisconsin. 
Um, so, so we won. And we thought, oops, well, here's what happened. For six months, nothing happened. Uh, and we desperately wanted to get the farmers back uh, uh, on the, their land. But uh, Howard Baker got an amendment through, which created the God Committee. And people say God Squad, which sounded to me a little frivolous. So we said God Committee, uh, Endangered Species Committee. And it, you see, these are cabinet level officers who are not allowed to send uh, the delegate. They must go themselves. They sat for three hours as a high level blue ribbon body of experts laid out the economics. And they only were to look at future economics. The sunk costs were to be ignored. And I was sitting there in the audience with Pat Parento. And, 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 and there was silence after the experts presented the economics. And then Charles Schultz, who was the chairman of economic advisors, who had been put there when they knocked out the uh, chairman of the Council of Environmental Quality, uh, he started speaking. And I thought, oh god, what's going to come now? He said, here's a project that's 95% complete. And it was at that point. TVA had been rushing three, three shifts a, a night to do everything but, but dam the, the valley. And he said, and if one takes just the cost of finishing it against the total project benefits and does it properly, it still doesn't pay, which says something about the original design. And the room breaks out in laughter because everyone in that room, including all the lobbyists who were against us, knew that this was true. But here it was spoken out in a room for the first time. When we got the injunction, page one above the fold in virtually every newspaper in the United States. When the God Committee decided for us unanimously, it was either not covered, not on the evening news, or back on page 24, I think, of the Times. And, 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 and so, you see, we had accomplished really a remarkable amount, including going up through the agencies, up through Congress, uh, uh, ducking a hearing, uh, uh, ducking an amendment, then, then going through the Supreme Court, and then through a unique committee which had been created to handle uh, uh, people like us, and, and we had won. Nothing happened again for six months. Uh, we were begging the Carter appointees to get the farmers back on the land, thinking that if they're back on the land, the reporters would see if they were ever uh, attempted to be dragged off again. But in the evening, when no one was in the chamber, the appropriations, the pork barrel, uh, uh, appropriations Committee was sitting there. They stood up, Mr. Chairman, we have an amendment uh, from Duncan of Tennessee. And he only read to the word notwithstanding. It was 42 seconds. We, I waive the reading of the amendment. The chair looks out, and there is the committee, the Appropriations Committee. Is this okay with the majority? Yes. Minor minority? Yes. All right. Questions on, and boom, it passed. Don Weaver of, of Oregon was waiting by the podium to say something. He never knew until he opened uh, the congressional record the next morning what had happened. Uh, but notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, um, the following project should be completed. A, Teleco Dam. Uh, now, we, we fought it some more, uh, and the White House helped a lot, uh, but uh, it was passed uh, uh, by the Senate. Um, and, and Jimmy Carter said, line up the votes to sustain the veto in either the House or the Senate. And our people from Tennessee, and this is where the national environmental groups came in, we had more than enough votes in both the House and the Senate. And Jimmy Carter, uh, late one night, uh, I was sitting there and got the phone call from Air Force One. And uh, Deacon is, is, I said, I don't know any Deacon. That, that was a code name for Jimmy Carter because he was so religious. Um, and, and I thought, OK, we're going to go fight to uphold this veto. And he said, Professor Plotter, I've decided to sign the bill. The subcommittee chairman was insisting on it. And, and, and he wanted me, what, what did he want? Uh, did, uh, I absolve you of, 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 the, of this. I said, and I held him for about seven, uh, seven to 10 minutes. Mr. President, you are hurting a precedent that incorporates all of your environmental policy. There's an economic analysis that shows that good ecology is good economics. I know, but I think I had to do it. I said, no environmentalist 
thinks that's so. He said, well, I'm an environmentalist. And I said, an environmentalist doesn't knock down a pre and, and, and Poor guy. Here was this self-righteous guy from, from, from wherever I was from. And he just wanted to get off the phone. Uh, but to show you what hypocrites we were, what do we do then? We filed a Cherokee lawsuit. You can repeal all the laws, but you can't repeal the Constitution. And remember, Chota was the religious heart. All right, we, of course, got dismissed by Judge Taylor, uh, went to the Sixth Circuit, and we lost by one vote there because they said, we hadn't put evidence on the record of the centrality of the Indian religion to this site. That's because no court had ever said before you had to do that. Uh, we took it to the Supreme Court, but it didn't work. And that's Coiti Spring. Mud flowing out and, and onto the main spawning ground. They, they closed the dam. This is Gene Ritchie's barn getting bulldozed. This is Nell. Uh, the, did you see the wrecker here down, down there? And then they dug a hole and put her house in it and burned it. And then Nell, she's, she's pulling out a table leg. Uh, Asa had made her a table. And they uh, burned it. So I mean, you, you, you get the, the emotional bang. And, and then for two years, the, the project, of course, nobody came in to build an industrial city. Uh, TVA was really embarrassed. They tried to get TVA employees to come and buy waterfront land, uh, but that didn't work. So then they were going to make it a regional toxic waste disposal project. Uh, but just to know, I got a tip off from within TVA, and I put it on the UPI wire, and within 12 hours, it was no more toxic waste. So, so some stories will get through with enough emotion to, to have a, a, a enough impact. But after two years, they got a Walmart subsidiary to come and take land and build uh, 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 retirement homes uh, along. Koiti, do you see? You, you destroy a place and, and put it under 10 feet of mud and then name your community after it. Um, th this is what the project basically has brought. And, and do you see, when you leave your marina, you go out and what are those things in the water? Those are Jiminy Von Stewart's silos. Just, just amazing. Still standing there. L local kids go siloing. You jump off into the water. Uh, that's Ben Clark's. This is Bart Idens. Now, as you look around, there is an industrial park smaller than ours, and it has a few uh, 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 industries, but none the, that required a, a lake. It, they, they wanted to have cheap industrial land. Uh, when, when you dam up a, a rich uh, lake, it gets uh, uh, pretty well contaminated. And, and this is the Sewell's silo. And, and, and it's kind of like a gesture. <laughs> and maybe that's what we can start talking about. But oh, and, and so uh, on the website that, that Bob and Jan and Shauna set up, uh, is the 30-year memorial. But, but Margaret, uh, uh, Ace's uh, uh, daughter, brought his hat. Um, um, OK, so, so we've covered a lot of ground. What is the argument for TVA? TVA will say, look, we transplanted the fish. And it's true. The fish was not wiped out. They put it into two rivers where previously it hadn't existed, um, but it looks as if it's flourishing there. Um, and, and as a biologist, I, in, in fact, Berger asked me this, during, couldn't you transplant it? And I said, well, the fact that they're not there naturally probably means that there's a problem. But so far, the little fish uh, has, has survived. Uh, TVA will say, if you took a vote in Tennessee, the river defenders would lose. And that clearly is true. Uh, TVA had a tremendous PR, and we were communists, they, not just in the local press. I couldn't get the local press to print the image of that alternative future for the valley. No one would put a story about bringing people up into the park with the millions of dollars that was right at hand, uh, uh, rather than an, uh, uh, whatever uh, was there. By, by de destroying the historical sites, you destroyed uh, an incredible, you know, for environmentalists, you can't just say nay. You have to be truthful in what you say, and you have to look 
for credible alternatives that are win-win, and we'd done that, and we'd carried it to the highest level. Um, all right, back to my three questions. Senator Baker's right-hand man, hatchet man, Jim Range, said to me, yes, the public cares about wildlife. Uh, and you know, most of the public, when they care about wildlife, care about trout or one particular. So people who care about all wildlife are, are, are a much narrower group. Uh, endangered species, um, there it is a, a, a principle. And sometimes it's based on, on religion or morality or ethics. Sometimes it's sentiment. If you have something with big uh, uh, brown eyes, as, as Howard Baker said, when we passed that law, we were, in we were thinking of warm fuzzies, not little cold slimies. He, he actually said that. Uh, and, and, but the utilitarian are, oh, I've got to tell this story. So, so there's this hearing uh, on endangered species. And the, 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 we didn't have many representatives. And one guy was there. He's got kind of sitting like this. Not, not, you know, he had to be there. And our biologist said, well, it's like burning books before you learn to read them. We've got to save these little species for what? And, and he said, I don't know if you can cure cancer. But obviously, that's a utilitarian argument. Uh, but for instance, we've discovered an endangered shell uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the Keys that represses genital herpes. Because what what's that? And, and then he looked around and, oh, and, and, and sat back. So I would suggest that that gentleman received a utilitarian justification for, for uh, environmental protection. And the God Committee is a way of saying, all right, this is the cost of what you're losing, but the God Committee amendment, which, which is another story, was written by a student of ours who had never taken the law course she was an undergraduate who, she said, not only do you look at the costs being imposed and the benefits of having the species, but you look at what? Costs, benefits, alternatives. And that's the kind of balance. Because endangered species can't be absolute. Be because if you're an absolutist, you're a fool, whether you're an environmentalist or, or Rush Limbaugh. And so the balance is what you work for. And I would suggest that, that this case was a precedent giving some credibility to the act uh, and, and also the God Committee as a vehicle for really a socially quite, quite uh, uh, thoughtful balance. All right, in any event, so, so it seems to me the hatchet man for Baker said the public cares about wildlife cares about endangered species. But the public concern for endangered species is a mile wide and an inch deep, right? But if you can show that the species is getting in the way of human pleasures, people will turn against it every time. And, and so that indeed was part of the way it was to be framed. Stupid little fish stopping recreation, but they always started with electricity there was a little canal that would lead some water into a nearby uh, lake that did have generators. Uh, uh, and, and we couldn't, in any event. Second question, were we hypocrites to take a statute that clearly would never have been passed if Congress, by the way, there were three or four people in Congress who knew what was happening because they put that institutionalized caution and the other stuff on the record. But what hypocrites? to know that we were using a statute that the legislature did not understand had any teeth in it, like NEPA, uh, when it was first uh, uh, put in, in the hopper. Uh, and, and then, so what can you say? Our argument, of course, was canary in the coal mine. That what's the first law of ecology? Do, do you know? Everything is connected to everything else. You cannot rip something apart and say, oh, wildlife protection is, is different. And so, 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 and, and what do we put Al Capone in jail for? Did we prove that he was a racketeer? No, we proved that he hadn't paid taxes on his rackets. Uh, and so the idea uh, is, uh, all right. The, the, the third question I gave you is, is the question of governance. Because, I mean, we start out, where else but in America could a little group of people so lacking in money and power and, and tenure uh, have carried a case like this showing a mistake of this 
this volume up through the courts, up through the agencies, up through the halls of Congress, through the Supreme Court of the United States, and through this extraordinary uh, executive cabinet level committee. I mean, it, it's, but what made the difference? I, I think it was the US Chamber of Commerce. And, and also you remember the post Goldwater right wing, they couldn't attack the Clean Air Act, right? What, when you think of attacking the Clean Air Act, what image comes? You know, grandma choking of, of, of air pollution, right? You can't attack clean water, uh, Adler would sue you, but, but also you think of the tap producing crummy water. But endangered species, they decided it was the wedge. This would become the epitome of environmental extremism of the stupidity of the, uh, the environmentalists. The pendulum has swung too far. It's time to bring it back to common sense. Ignoring the fact that who was extreme? Was it we ignoring economics? But the media and, and the political hype created such a drum roll that the guys in Congress knew they could do this. And Jimmy, oh, on the afternoon, that I got that call from Air Force One. Jimmy Carter had a veto message and a signing message. And he got in the plane. As he was getting in the plane, he was flying up to New Jersey to address some, some American Legion group. Frank uh, uh, Moore, who was his um, a liaison with, with Congress, um, said, Mr. President, I've heard you're planning to veto this bill that Congress has just passed overriding the, the teleco injunction. Um, and, and Jimmy Carter said, yes, and also it prevents any economic review of any other water projects. And, well, Mr. President, if you veto this tomorrow morning, every editorial cartoonist in the country is going to show you holding a snail darter in one hand and a killer rabbit in the other. Do you remember those? Were, there was a rabbit when he was fishing that tried to bite him in the media. Went, well, and you cannot stand that kind of publicity. The, the, the trouble with, now I haven't heard that from, from, from the guy who actually was supposed to have said it, but I've heard it secondhand, and, and it's believable that the media spin was so powerful and so diametrically wrong that the President of the United States said, oh, the subcommittee chairman is insisting on it, and, 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 and goes with it. All right. So, so the lesson here of governance is that you cannot rely on Congress, the executive branch. Uh, and, and the judicial. Nor can you rely on the fourth branch of government. The fourth estate is the media. It requires citizen action to observe, to be the truth teller, to be the kid that, that says the emperor isn't wearing clothes. I, I've said to my students, and I guess this is the way to end it, uh, but because it seems to me, I think this is something that maybe a, a book could do. I tell my students when I'm feeling philosophical, like Yoda, um, <laughs> scratch away at almost any environmental controversy, and pretty soon you find yourself looking at essential questions of democracy. And, and, and I guess it's that. I don't mean to be grandiose, but this little story, this little fish, these little people uh, made me proud. Um, OK, any questions? Or you can run for the door. Thank <laughs> you.